Greetings. This is Professor Milsom. <clears throat> I want to go over um, the use of figurative language in Frankenstein, but also it's just a general uh, overview, a lot of this review, about how authors use figurative language and uh, imagery in their writing. One of the things that makes works of fiction, such as Frankenstein, difficult to read is because there is a lot of figurative language, but by looking carefully at that language, you can start to understand some of the, the deeper meanings and the significance of the prose. So we'll jump right in. This is a passage from the beginning. Notice I've cited it using proper MLA in-text citation here in white. Um, it's page 22 in the edition I had you buy, um, but if you're using a different edition, this is chapter 2. Remember, the book starts out with a bunch of letters from this guy Walton, and then within his letters we have a bunch of chapters which are Victor Franken Frankenstein narrating, telling his life story to Walton. So this is a story in a story. So this is chapter 2 of Victor Frankenstein's story within Walton's letters. And uh, I'm just going to read this to you and then we're going to talk about how we dissect difficult passages like this and picture the imagery being created. So he says, quote, I at once gave up my former occupations, set down natural history and all its progeny as deformed and abortive creation, and entertained the greatest disdain for a would-be science, which could never even step with it in the threshold of real knowledge, unquote. So where we're at here is he is a kid, he's a teenager obsessed with science, and he had gotten into these old-fashioned sort of scientific modes, uh, natural history, not, not like the Natural History Museum, but um, a field of science that we would look more like magic to us today. And um, suddenly he had witnessed a storm and seen lightning strike. And then this scientist who was staying with his family explained electricity or lightning, explained lightning to him. And, and this changed him. He gave up his former interest in this old fashioned science, which he realized was not anything like real science. Okay. So that's the general meaning of this passage, but you have to sort of break it down to see all the, all the nuances emerge. So when we talk about imagery, this comes from page five in your prosody handbook, which by the way, is on the English 111 resources page. You need to download it and read it. We use this a little bit during the poetry unit. So imagery. When we write about literature, we use the term imagery more often than almost any other term. It can mean literal description of things, mental pictures evoked by the author that appeal to the senses, sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. And it can also refer to figurative language, such as metaphor, simile, and personification. And um, so to just keep this in mind in this, in this lecture, we're gonna talk about the difference between literal things, literal descriptions, versus figurative language. And authors, you know, they're communicating, they're creating imagery for us in their writings. We're picturing the things that they write about and they can just say things directly through literal description or they can use figurative language. And we'll talk about why they do that. So just to go over this, the first thing you wanna do when you look at a passage like this is you look up all the words you don't know as usual. So natural history, progeny, disdain, threshold, Natural history, like I said, this if you look, if you Google this phrase, it's not totally going to give you what it means here. You have to also look at the context a lot of the time when you're looking things up. There's a big mistake we make is just, just looking things up and then not paying attention to the context. But here, natural history it refers to an old-fashioned science based on alchemy and magic. Alchemy, by the way, not to define something with another word you might not know, but... 
alchemy was this old fashioned sort of magical science where people were trying to figure out how to turn things into gold using chemistry. Wouldn't that be nice if you could just turn things into gold? Well, obviously it hasn't worked. And then progeny means one's children. So if you have a child, that's your progeny. Um, in this case, natural history and its progeny, that's a metaphorical use of it. Science can't have children, right? Um, disdain is another phrase for hatred. And threshold just means the doorstep. So, all right, we've looked everything up. First, look up all the words. Second, try to come up with a picture. So this is me drawing. So so he learns about ele you know, electricity, basically. And I at once gave up all my former occupations, set down natural history and all its progeny. So here I've drawn natural history and its progeny, its kids. So this is a metaphor, like natural history can't actually have children, but it means things that came out of natural history, things related to natural history. I set them down as a deformed and abortive creation. So this is, you know, a sort of nasty image, right? Um, he's comparing natural history to a creature that's deformed and has been aborted. And if you're thinking about fetuses, like, that's definitely intended. And keep in mind, Mary Shelley was pregnant when she wrote this. And she had had a bunch of miscarriages and stillborn children. So she is also thinking about deformed fetuses and abortive fetuses that don't work. And really what this means is he's talking about a form of science that doesn't work, that doesn't create life. And this is a book about a scientist who wants to create life from death. So, of course, he's going to discard science that doesn't work, that leads to death, right? Okay, so this is a picture. And then the second part, entertained with greatest disdain. I entertained the greatest disdain. So I hated this would-be science. He's like a wannabe science, which could never even step within the threshold of real knowledge. So here we have real knowledge as if it has a doorstep. It's implying real. there's the door to real knowledge, right? right this way, and here's the threshold, and he's saying natural history can never go here because it's bad science, meaning natural history is not real knowledge. It can't, it can't even come near the door of real knowledge. So, you know, if, if you break it down like this, you can see very clearly what she means. Do you have to do this for every metaphor and simile? No, you, you do this in your head, usually, and you get the meaning pretty quick, but Breaking it down like this makes it very clear what's going on, right? Okay, so there's the big picture. Natural history, this abortive, deformed creature is so fake. Um, it's, 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 wannabe, it's wannabe science. It can't even come near the door of real knowledge. Okay, so that's us breaking up the imagery based on looking up the words. And now we have a very precise, clear idea of what's going on here. So then, you know, it's English class, so you have to write about it. You have to figure out what it means. You write up your analysis. So looking at this very precisely enables us to come up with very clear analytical writing. And I wrote this uh, just for fun, I guess. Um, this is what I wrote. Dr. Frankenstein is disappointed by the results of his experiments he discards the failed science of natural history which he realizes doesn't work having discovered a new modern electricity infused science that has greater potential frankenstein knows that natural history his former passion will never even be able to metaphorically approach the vicinity let alone threshold of real knowledge he rejects it natural natural history and all its progeny as deformed and abortive creations personifying the field and its offshoots as disposable, less-than-human creatures that will fail to live. You cannot help but think with sympathy of Shelley herself writing this, a pregnant woman who's already experienced a few mis who's experienced a few miscarriages already. Okay, you'll notice I use this word personifying here, uh, metaphorically. Notice I didn't just say, like, 
Shelley uses metaphor and personification to blah, 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 blah. You can use the words in different ways to point them out. The point isn't to point out the metaphor or the personification. The point here is to talk about the meaning. I always say this, emphasize the meaning, not the literary elements. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we know when we're dealing with figures of speech or figurative language? Well, we use figures of speech all the time. Um, and I want you to see that, that you already do this. You already know how this works. And imagery, images in literature often make use of figurative language to make a point. Sometimes they just use literal language. But again, here's the definition from your prosody handbook, which you can find in the English 111 resources page. Okay, so this, again, I want to emphasize, we use figures of speech all the time. This is why it feels familiar. Images in literature often use, make use of figurative language to make a point. So for example, here's, here's some figures of speech you already know. It's raining cats and dogs. Okay, is it literally raining cats and dogs? No, I mean, I wish, I love cats and dogs. But no, it just means it's raining hard. Or when someone says she fell head over heels in love with him. Okay, she didn't literally fall, you know, tumble around on the ground. It's just saying she's really in love with him. Or for those of you who speak Spanish, I mean, this is in all languages we have this. So you could say, estar como una cabra. You are crazy. That's, that's, it's saying like to be like a goat, right? When you call someone a goat, saying they're like a goat, you don't mean they're literally a goat, right? They're not actually a goat. You're just saying they're, they're crazy, which by the way is an ableist slur and we shouldn't call people that. Um, I'm trying to remove the stigma of mental health issues, but anyway, that's a figure of speech you probably, um, you may have heard if you speak Spanish. And here's another one I learned. I'm learning Spanish. This is why I'm interested in this. No tener pelos en la lengua. So it means not to have hair on your tongue. And when you say that about someone, you're not saying they don't actually, you're not talking about hair on tongues, like no one has hair on their tongues, but what you're saying is someone without hair on their tongue is someone who says what they think, someone who's honest, as if like hair on your tongue prevents you from telling the truth, right? Again, I got these from, these are figures of speech from students that show you we use figurative language all the time. So you could say it's brick outside. Um, I've never heard this. I had never heard this before, but students say it's a thing people say, and, and it means it's cold. It's not like you walk outside and it's there's bricks, right? But I think it, it probably refers to like smashing up against a brick wall, like that's how cold it feels. Or people say, I'm dying of hunger. Well, you're not literally dying. It just means you're hungry. Um, dead ass, right? People say this all the time. It's a way of saying I'm serious or seriously, but you're not like your, your ass didn't literally die. I had a student who would always like say, oh, I'm weak, or, I'm dead. And she, she didn't actually mean she was weak or dead. Like you can't even say you're dead if you're dead, right? But she, she just usually said that to me. She's funny. Or let's say like I walk into the classroom and I go, the party's about to start. Like, is, is a party literally about to start? No, quite the opposite. It's like class. But it's a joke, but it also means things are beginning. Um, here's another one. It's lit. Okay, if someone says it's lit, it can mean a lot of things. It definitely doesn't mean the lights just went on. Um, it can mean like we're having fun. And then I heard this girl on the phone in the hallway the other day who was really upset. And she goes, oh, it's about to be lit. And I was like, oh, I think that's not good. It probably means a fight's about to start. Um, so I hope those those girls are okay. But it was about. To, she wasn't saying, oh, I'm about to like literally turn the lights on, right? So you get it. We use figurative speech all the time. Um, and here's the definition. You should be taking notes. Liter uh, so there's literal language, language that means exactly what it says. So if it's raining outside and I say, it's raining really hard, or if I'm hungry and I say, I am really hungry, that's literal. But figurative language is language that says one thing in order to mean another. So instead of saying it's raining, I say it's raining cats and dogs. 
well, you know I'm not talking about dogs and cats, you know I'm making, uh, it's a figure of speech, it's a metaphor for rain. If I say I'm dying of hunger, you know I'm not really dying, you know I'm just saying I'm hungry. Okay, for uh, some more examples. You walk, you say, you greet someone, you say, hi honey. You're not literally greeting a jar of honey or something, right? It's a figure of speech. Hi honey, you're comparing the person to honey, which is sweet and which you like, okay? Um, hello, sunshine. You're, you're not literally saying hello to the sun. You're probably saying hi to someone who's warm and cheerful or you're being sarcastic. Like if someone looks gloomy and you're like, hello, sunshine. Okay, you're, you're being sarcastic. Depends on tone. Zip it. I'm like, tell someone, zip it. You're not literally putting a zipper on someone's mouth. You're just telling them to shut up. And there are three types of figurative language I want you to pay attention to. This is what we, you know, talk about in literary um, scholarship a lot. Also, uh, there's other kinds of figurative language, but these are the main ones. There's metaphor, which is an implied comparison between two seemingly unlike things to evoke some sort of meaning. For example, your warm smile. Well, a smile can't literally be warming, but it means it's nice, right? A simile is a comparison of two seemingly unlike, unlike things using like or as to evoke some sort of meaning. So it's more direct than a metaphor. For example, your smile is warm, like the sun. Here, your smile's friendliness is being compared to the soothing warmth of the sun. Compare that to the metaphor, that comparison was implied. Like your warm smile is like, your smile is like something that's warm. But here, in the simile, it's a direct comparison between the sun warmth and the warmth of your smile so personification is a little bit trickier we saw it with natural natural history having progeny like it's when you give human qualities to a non-human object to invoke some sort of meaning so here the smiling sun the sun can't literally smile but it means it's a nice day out or with the natural history earlier you know natural history can't literally have progeny only people or creatures can have progeny, but you get the meaning. It's like things that come from something else. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. Identifying figurative language. When you spot a metaphor simile, here's what you do, or personification. You identify it. One, identify it. Is it metaphor, simile, or personification? Two, figure out what two things are being compared. It's not always obvious, like the warm smile. It's not obvious, like, what is warm or, you know, what the smile is being compared to, but something warm. Then you analyze, what is the point of that comparison? Why didn't the author just say something literally? Okay, so that's, that's, this is the point. Like, sometimes it's not that deep, but sometimes it is. As we saw with the natural history progeny metaphor, like, we get into all kinds of stuff about dead fetuses and, um, you know, impossibility of birthing things and you, it, it, it takes it to another level that you might have skipped over had you not thought about it but when you write about it please note and this is why I wrote here the point is not to identify the figurative language for its own sake the point is to figure out what the author is communicating and you you know listing literary elements like the author uses metaphor simile and personification and setting and diction this is not the same thing as analyzing literature but identifying figurative language is a way to break down what you read and understand it better. So when we're taught, like let's say you went to New York City High School or New York High School and you took the Regents, you're taught to list literary elements. That's a very sort of unsophisticated way of analyzing literature. And it's not that interesting. You can write good literary analysis without referring to any literary elements. And you can write bad literary analysis and list all the literary elements. So good analysis is not dependent on listing literary elements. Just keep that in mind. Um, so you get away from that. What I'm interested in is the meaning, okay? And why do we use this figurative language anyway, if not to create interesting imagery and evoke pictures as we're writing? So that's, you wanna always ask yourself like, why didn't the author just say this in a more direct way? What was the point of creating the imagery to go along with the meaning? 
So here's what you do. For, so you identify it. Okay, hello sunshine, this is a metaphor. You figure out the comparison. This metaphor compares the sunshine with the person I'm speaking to. Analyze it. It suggests that I feel affection for this person who is apparently warm and pleasant. Then four, write about it. The warmth of the sun seemed equal to the warmth she felt upon seeing her friend. So she greeted her by saying, hello, sunshine. And you'll notice I didn't even say metaphor in that sentence, but that was, that was analytical. Okay, so let's look at a couple more examples of figurative language in Frankenstein. So this is, this is right after the last quote I gave you. So he's, he's still a teenager, Frankenstein. He's talking about his, his uh, education. This is before he goes to college. But so there was a time after he learned about electricity and, and he d rejected natural history, which he had been obsessed with. <coughs> he's, he's, he got really into mathematics and it was a good break for him. It almost saved him from the the dark path he would go down later. And so this quote, he's talking about that. He says, when I write, Shelley's narrator Frankenstein states, quote, when I look back, it seems to me as if this almost miraculous change of inclination and will, so my new interest in math, was an immediate suggestion of the guardian angel of my life, the last effort made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me. Avert means to prevent. So his guardian angel sent him an interest in math, basically, to try to redirect him, to avert the storm that was even then hanging in the stars, ready to envelop me. So I drew a little picture here. Here's little Victor Frankenstein. Wow, I wrote enveloped. That's spelled wrong. Enveloped. So here's Frankenstein enveloped by the storm, meaning surrounded by. If you envelop something, it's like putting it in an envelope, right? This is the storm, the which the storm is a metaphor for the chaos, for chaos and destruction, right? It's not literally a storm coming. And then it says, um, the storm that was even then hanging in the stars, ready to envelop me. So if a storm is like waiting around in the stars, it's like up in the air, it hasn't come yet. But also in the stars sort of implies fate. Like if something's written in the stars, you know, think about Simba, for instance. It means it's, it's in your future. It's your fate. So he's saying here that when I look back, it seems to me as this almost miraculous change of inclination and will, this sudden interest in math. It was, almost, it was an immediate suggestion of the guardian angel. That could be another image I didn't illustrate, like a guardian angel telling him to be interested in math. The last effort made by the spirit of preservation to avert the storm, that's this, to d redirect the storm that was even then hanging in the stars and ready to envelop me. So it's a saying like it was in his fate to eventually be enveloped or surrounded by a storm, chaos and destruction. But for a while, it was held back. Okay, here's another one. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. It's a couple chapters later. Notice I've used correct MLA citation. By the way, in the last one, I didn't write Shelley in the parentheses because I had already used her name in the sentence. You see that? When you cite something, you don't have to use the author's name if it, in the parentheses if you already did in the sentence. Okay, so here, back to this. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. So this, now he's in college. He's getting interested in um, bringing life from death. His, his big project is he finds body parts in the graveyard, and he's going to bring them back to life using electricity. And <clears throat> as he's beginning his experiments and starting to find success, <clears throat> he's getting very excited. So no one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards. So the feelings are bearing him onwards, carrying him onwards. That's not literal, right? You can't be carried by your feelings. Like a hurricane, so we've got like, this is a simile, so the, the, the feelings are like a hurricane when he feels his first enthusiasm from success. So, okay, here we go. Here's, 
here's the hurricane. These are his feelings of enthusiasm and success, and they're carrying him. Here he is sitting on top of this hurricane of feelings. Yay! This is the hurricane of a variety of feelings caused by success. Okay? And again, one thing you might analyze, point out, is look, there's, more, there's so much storm imagery, right? And why do you think that is? Well, he's talking about electricity. Electricity is, <clears throat> electricity is like the key to how he got dead life to come back to the life, right? Dead, dead matter to come to life. So it's no coincidence that so much of this imagery revolves around storms and storminess. Um, it's a constant theme through this book because it's directly connected to what he's doing. All right. I think this is the last one I give you. Page uh, 33. The moon gazed on my midnight labors while, with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness, I pursued nature to her hiding places. This is deep, right? So the moon gazed on my midnight labors. Can moons really gaze? No, they don't have eyes. They're not people. So that's a personification of the moon. Okay, and also it's saying basically he's up at night working. It's creepy. He's like in his lab being creepy, working all night with unrelaxed and breathless eagerness. He's like so excited he can barely breathe. And what's he doing? He's pursuing nature to her hiding places. What does that mean? Can you, okay, so here we have the moon gazing on Frankenstein, right? She looks concerned. Here he is. Oh, sounds like a fire truck going by. Sorry about that. And then here is his lab. Here's some body parts. And he's being, he's like breathless and unrelaxed. He's very stressed out. And, th and so what he's doing here, he compares to pursuing nature into her hiding places. Notice that nature is personified as female. So this image of him chasing after a female to her hiding places. I mean, we've had caves before, haven't we? This is pretty gothic. It sounds kind of rapey a little bit. Um, again, we're in a new genre in science fiction, but we still haven't left the gothic behind, have we? And this is an image that's meant to be compared to Frankenstein in his lab, right? So this is a metaphorical image that helps us understand how he was behaving in his lab. His pursuit of reanimating dead matter, this pursuit was like a literal pursuit of nature. He's trying to chase nature. Nature doesn't want to be caught. You know, he's trying to learn the secrets of nature. And the biggest secret of all is how to create life from death. So you can see how breaking down these images, we really get a full, full picture of what this book is telling us. This is a warning, right? Like, you're not supposed to chase nature to places she doesn't want you to find her. You're not supposed to try and find out these secrets. It's very dangerous. And it's, it's also sort of a gothic pursuit, isn't it? It's, it's taking advantage of things that you're not supposed to take advantage of. And... Nature is not pleased. I mean, we have the moon here sort of watching, concerned. So hopefully uh, these deeper analyses of these short passages show you how much you can do with very little. Like this isn't even a whole sentence here. Yet you could write a whole paper on that, on this meaning of like the gothic chase of nature and how that relates to him in his lab and <clears throat> and... When I tell you you can write a lot about very little, this is what I mean. But it requires that you spend some time with each word and create pictures. And usually, like I said, we do this in our minds. We do this all the time. <clears throat> but now we're just doing it out loud and using slightly harder words. But because we all do this all the time, I fully believe that this is something that we can actually all do. And I encourage you to spend... A little bit of time doing this and there's an extra credit assignment um, where you can do an image like this yourself and post it okay i hope this makes sense if you have any questions please be in touch